What the? <laughs> Still naked as the day you were born. Ugh. The Terminator's here to wreck some face. Oh shit. Okay, welcome to the final Death Ball game, and not even a game. This is the CIA, the real CIA. So, this is where the plot gets a little uh, complicated. I'm not sure if we're, uh, how much of this information we're really supposed to know. I guess the fax machine kind of spells it out, but uh, I'll, I'll let the level go on for a little bit longer before I fill you in on the details, because I'll be honest, the first time I played this, I was... The the uh, the plot the plot at this point was a little lost on me by the end. I I, I probably should have been paying a little more attention. But yes, this is the CIA. Um, this level isn't good. <laughs> I'm gonna be totally honest. At first, it is it is cool and it is satisfying um, to tear through the enemies. This game this uh, this this place has a lot of enemies. Uh, it's basically one giant enemy gauntlet. And um, at first it's really cool, and the music is really, it really gets you pumped and really exciting, but uh, my god, does this game take way too long. Uh, this is, uh, if I remember correctly, by far the longest death ball game. The only one that might be longer is Coffee and Donuts, and even then, that one, I would also say, overstated its welcome. Maybe just a, a little bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, this this game takes freaking forever, and at, there's a certain point where it, it, it gets, it, it starts, it really overstays its, well, its welcome, because uh, as far as new mechanics it introduces, it doesn't. It, it does have a, a couple of mechanics, but they're not. They're not particularly interesting, and the the level aesthetics itself again are cool at first, but by the end of it, it it's it's so boring. It, this this one is. This one's a little rough to get through. Hopefully, hopefully, I, I'll we'll we'll find some fun in it. I'm sure we will. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, uh, say hello to these giant skull enemies. We've been seeing them throughout the game, like these enemy spawners. And uh, this this level loves enemy spawners uh, just a lot, as you'll be seeing. It, it's pretty ridiculous. These giant skulls pretty much fill every single room of this place. On the right side, since there's so many enemies, you're going to be uh, seeing level 3 charge attacks all the time, which is nice. There we go. Uh, this level does have a lot of uh, different, like, kind of alternate paths to actually deal with, so that is that is something to uh, keep in mind. Thankfully, because of the overhead view, it's kind of similar to Life is Destroy, where you can actually kind of, like, tell uh, where you have and haven't been. Oh my god. God, we're fucked. Get out of there. There we go. Hey, you took out all the enemies for me. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> well, there's your proof that they only have one health. Because we just killed that guy with an uncharged beam katana. Oh, fuck. Sheet man already. Screw you. Nice. Damn it. No. Shit. Oh, please don't die. Come on, man. There we go. 
Okay, we actually completely missed the alternate path. I actually accidentally went the right way. So I'm just going to go back and grab what's over here real quick. Not that it really matters. I guess there's an XP bug over there, but still. Okay, let's see how we deal with this. There we go. Oh, God, that was bad. Okay, we need to heal really bad. There we go. Nice. Perfect. And an EXP guy for our ward. Nice. There we go. Okay, and we also missed a, a path down here as well. I, I did not mean to go the correct way uh, immediately, but oh well. I guess it's just a box, but what's inside the box? There we go. Okay, now I'll head back to that. Uh, the exit. Okay. Let's head on to the next area. There's a lot. Okay, here we come to our first uh, main gimmick of this place. And uh, yeah, this is uh, this is what I call the uh, YouTube slash Twitch compression <laughs> room. Uh, I'm not sure how this is going to look on YouTube. This is probably going to look like a nightmare. But uh, essentially, this area will fill up with glitchy bites, and you can only see the center of the screen unless you step on these purple panels. Also, an arcade cabinet. Please insert 150 blessings medal to load. Okay, what the hell is going on? Uh, yeah, if you're if you're not fully aware uh, <laughs> of uh, what that is, then uh, you're you're in for a surprise in a second. This is this is uh, was inspired by indie games after all. So yeah, as you can see, this. I hope you like this mechanic, by the way, because this is the primary thing you're going to have to be dealing with for the majority of this level. I told you this level wasn't very good, and uh, this is one of the main reasons, because one of the few gimmicks that it does have is a complete eyesore, and it's a real, uh, real annoyance to actually look at. Uh, can I press the panel? There we go. Jeez. Thankfully, I have a toilet right in the center of this uh, room, so we can use it whenever we want. Okay, thankfully there's a purple panel right on this one, so we can just turn off the glitchiness whenever we want, thankfully. Screw you, buddy. Okay, there we go, nice. Okay, let's turn it off again. It's kind of annoying, because if you're standing on the panel and then the glitch activates, you can't actually deactivate it. It's like, you have to step off the platform and then do it, it's kind of annoying. Speaking of, we're going to have to do it again, there we go. Screw you guys. This level almost feels like kind of like a test level that they threw together, as in, like, to see, like, okay, how much enemies can we handle on screen at once? Because, admittedly, it is impressive how many how many enemies this game does fit on screen at once, but it's not, uh, and again, it is fun for a little bit, but it isn't, uh, it won't last. Trust me, you're going to be, especially with this glitchy screen, you're going to be wishing you were dead in, in a while. There's some mechanics later that, that are arguably worse than this, too. So, uh, yeah, this... I don't know what happened with this level. Okay. Another box. Really? It's gonna spawn enemies just for grabbing the box? There was nothing in it. Oh, boy. There we go. I'm going to have to recharge. There we go. Is there seriously nothing over here? What was the point? I'm actually not sure the right way to go now. <laughs> if only I could see. Okay, there we go. Oh, God. I swear, my eyes start actually, like... Like kind of like peeling over just looking at the screen it's very annoying okay we're gonna activate this right away there we go save you and me the trouble well there's a 50 blessings logo what is going on
Come on. Oh, we actually got our... Oh, we got our, our things uh, sealed. There we go. Okay, I should probably turn that off. There we go. Much better. Okay, screw these skull guys. Okay. Oh my god, he hit us from there? Really? You bastard. More of you. There we go. Spam heavy attack over and over again. Who cares? There we go. Christ. Okay. Now with that metal, let's actually head back to the uh, arcade cabinet. Uh, let's activate this. There we go. Okay. Let's pop her in. God. Richard, Rasmus, and Don Juan. Hello, Hotline Miami crossover, and hello, Dead Bodies. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Suda has made it no, um, no secret that this game is heavily influenced by Hotline Miami. Uh, Hotline Miami was like the direct inspiration for this game because he played Hotline Miami and he loved it so much. And he's like, you can make a game this good on a shoestring budget? No way! So he wanted to do, for his next game, he wanted to do a more uh, lower budget title. Because um, Hotline Miami proved to him that, you know, like indie games make great games too. And that's why this game is, is kind of like a celebration of indie games with all of the t shirts. And originally, this game was actually going to be, like, heavily indie-inspired. Like, there was going to be, like, different levels based on different indie games, and they were going to have, like, actual indie devs collaborating with them. But uh, pretty soon into the planning stages, Suda realized how much of a logistics nightmare that would be, and also that people might not be interested in the game if it if it felt like a mishmash of a bunch of other people's ideas. He wanted it to still feel like a Suda game, especially since it was his first time coming back to the directing chair for, for 10 years. So those plans were dropped, and the indie collaboration was just reduced to t-shirts. But uh, but that didn't stop Suda, because uh, even then he knew that he still wanted one very specific indie collaboration, and he actually met with the developers uh, themselves, uh, the... Uh, uh, Jonathan and uh, Dennis, I believe, are the are the names. Um, it's been a while since I played uh, Hotline Miami. Fantastic game, by the way. And he basically met with the devs and started like splur uh, like uh, splurging all over the place of like how much he loved their game and how much he wanted to do this uh, collaboration. So yeah, we get a little bit of a little bit of a crossover. Really, really cool. Hotline Miami is, is fantastic. I feel like the it's it's interesting that the Hotline Miami crossover happens in this level of all things because life is destroy specifically inside the houses is extremely reminiscent of Hotline Miami. Like there's like frantic music playing when you're killing everything, and then as soon as the house is clear, it's really tranquil, peaceful music, and the tr tranquil, peaceful music just happens to sound like Hotline Miami music. So I feel like it's weird that the collaboration with Hotline Miami is in this level, uh, when it when it should have been in Life is Destroy. It makes way more sense. I guess maybe they didn't do it in Life is Destroy because it would feel like actual plagiarism, maybe. 
but they're, he's collaborating with the actual creators of the game, so it, at that point, it'd be fine. I just find it interesting, because when I got If the Life is Destroy, I was spoiled on the fact that... Well, it, well, it wasn't spoiled. Suda outright said that there was a... There was indie collaborations in the form of t-shirts, and there was also a major collaboration with Hotline Miami. So I was expecting it the entire game. Um, and then when I got to Life is Destroy, I was like, oh, I, I guess that was it. Because it obviously was very, very similar. Um... But no, it's it's actually just tucked in the CIA. One cool thing I like about this though is because the camera is so zoomed out, a lot of the time uh, you'll see enemies like kind of like running towards you down the hallways, and that's a really cool, uh, really cool visual. I don't know, it it look it, it's satisfying to see the enemies run towards you. That didn't chain really. Okay, there we go. There we go. Screw those skull guys, man. And that was pointless. It, it, nothing was even there. Can I turn this off now? Thank you. Um. So yeah, I was, I was, I was gonna say. I think it would have been cool if if they kind of went all out Hotline Miami and kind of designed the levels around that. Um. For the CIA, instead of just making it these corridors. Um, but again, Life is Destroyed is so similar in terms of like the house layout and stuff to Hotline Miami. Um, so, I, I don't know. I'd highly recommend playing Hotline Miami, by the way. If we're, if we're going to talk about indie games, <laughs> that one is really, really good. Wrong number is as well. Wrong number, I'd say... It's tough, man. Because... Wrong number is actually kind of similar to Desperate Struggle, where it does some things better, but there's also a lot of disappointments to it. Um, I'd say the level design is is significantly worse in, in Wrong Number than it is in the original. And the level design in the original is fantastic, and I think it takes a little bit of a hit. In uh, speaking of taking hits, we gotta go, 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 because we're dying. I think the level design takes a little bit of a hit in Wrong Number, uh, but the soundtrack in Wrong Number is absolutely insane uh, how how good the soundtrack is just like desperate struggle and uh oh, did that kill him nice and the uh the story is uh really really hard to follow uh because it's told in out of chronological order and it's it's not even like it, it's it's pretty much jumping from different time periods constantly so actually following the story of the game on a first playthrough is nigh impossible unless you're writing down the specific dates of every cutscene uh, but once the story is all pieced together uh, and you're reading reddit threads after <laughs> uh, I, I think the story is actually very good um, uh, but yeah the, the first the first game is lauded for its obviously it's ultra violence and uh, fantastic music and level design uh, very visceral arcadey style gameplay which I you can definitely see the inspiration with this game. I I really do apologize for the glitchy screen, by the way. Like, there's nothing I can do. That's how the level is done. It's dumb, and there's nothing I can do. The the only thing I can do is just attempt to hit these switches, uh, quick quickly. I guess I don't know. It it's unfortunate. Is that two gold bugs? Fuck, man. I just broke his guard with light attacks. The game said I couldn't do that, and I just did. There we go. Screw you, buddy. Hey, ramen stand. Thank God. Heal me, please. <laughs> okay, back to full health, thankfully. 
Oh god, and our white sheepman. If it isn't obvious, we're gonna be fighting a lot of, uh, of, of sheepman throughout this whole level. There's a lot. This game throws a lot at you. Shit. Also, like, if you haven't noticed, the, all the sheepmen we're fighting are actually the variety of, like, colored sheepmen. So, this also kind of serves as, like, your, like, Mega Man style boss rush. But, unfortunately, we don't actually get to fight the, uh, the actual bosses. It's just the sheepmen. I said I, I mentioned this before in the in the No More Heroes one playthrough that it would have been cool if they kind of did a boss fight a boss rush like Mega Man style at the very end, but that would it, we kind of cheapen a lot of the assassins' deaths if you just refought them again. So I could I, I understand why they didn't, and uh, yeah we we probably earned a save. God, that t-shirt looked nice on us. I could have worn the Hotline Miami shirt, but to be totally honest, the Hotline Miami shirt actually blows. It's just the logo, and it kind of looks lame. It would have been cool if it had, like, the animal mask, mask on it. Hell, uh, like, just a shirt of every animal mask would be sick. Okay. A little bit deeper into the CIA now, and now we have another new mechanic to deal with. This one's <laughs> relatively simple. It's just... You can open doors with the blue switches. I know. The interns designed this level. That's why the mechanics are so basic and the hallways are so bland. Um, yeah, it's just... It's just doors that open buttons. So, uh, the doors only remain open for so long, so you need to act a little quick to get through. Screw this guy. Oh, by the way, I, I probably should have, uh, I probably should have switched out one of my chips for this. I don't know what I'm doing. But, uh, we can actually, uh, switch to, uh, the crossbone chip, which we got for the, uh, beating eight heart. And this one is actually crazy. I know I've been kind of ignoring, um, kind of ignoring a lot of the chips that we've been getting over the game by just showing them off and then just not using them because I prefer that original setup. But crossbone chip is actually crazy good. So we're going to replace the uh, throw maneuver with it just because I think the psycho chip has a little bit more uh, usefulness. And the lightning chip is obviously stupid good. So we'll keep that. Yeah, as soon as the crossbone chip actually recovers, uh, we can actually show it off. We are so low on battery. There we go. Not Joy-Con battery, thankfully. Okay, so crossbone chip. Let's throw it right here. Uh, oh, I, I, I activated the wrong one. My bad. I just activated the chip that you get for saving Gene in every level, which is the invisible chip. It just makes you invisible to enemies for a little bit. So useful. The only upside, I guess, is it recharges super quick, but what a lame ability, man. You have to go out of your way a lot, too. Like, I didn't mention it when I found Gene, but in um in Serious Moonlight, or uh, Damned, rather, you have to go pretty far to actually get Gene. Like, you have to spawn at, like, Toilet 3 and then play the level for a good, like, 10 minutes before you can actually get to where Gene is. So that's a little annoying. You have to do the same thing in uh, Electro Electric Thunder Tiger 2. So it's just kind of annoying that you have to do do that and your reward is pretty shit. Anyway, uh, rewards that aren't shit are the crossbone chip. So let's just throw this out. And this is a turret. And the turret can be damaged and can be destroyed. But as long as the enemies maintain in its view, he's going to be doing massive damage, like 16 a shot, and he fires pretty quick. So it's it's really good to like kind of keep enemies uh, pinned down while you're attacking them. Uh, and as you can see from the left, because the crossbone chip activates, as soon as you activate the crossbone chip, it will start recharging. So by the time that the crossbone chip actually like disappears, um, it's already like almost charged again. So we can just throw it up here. It can start dealing with all the guys over here uh, if I open the door for him. There we go. <laughs> 
swing and a miss, Travis. There we go. Okay, throw this out right here. One kind of annoying thing is that for some reason the crossbone chip doesn't actually read the enemy spawners as normal enemies, so it won't actually attack them. But uh, it will attack everything that the enemy spawner spits out, thankfully. Look at this nightmare and level design right here. This is ridiculous. You just chain lightning to all of them, though, so suck it. Nice! There we go. That was the perfect angle. I love that the tiger chip can pretty much go through walls, so you can really screw up enemies if you're uh, if you're good enough. Huh. Hey, Tony. Yeah, more bodies littering the floor. Uh, there's actually an interesting thing about these bodies that I, I should probably get into, but uh, let's probably save our game. I'm going to be delving into some plot. I mean, we got to talk about something while we're doing this crap. Okay, next level. Okay, so, the, um, basically the plot of what's happening right now, again, this was a little lost on me when I first played, there's the XP guys all, all over the place, is essentially what is happening, oh, this level sucks, this one takes forever just because of all the skull guys on the sides, um, essentially what has happened is that it, you, this plot will be completely lost on you if you weren't reading the fax machines, by the way, um, Right now, uh, we are playing, uh, we, we popped in the CIA death ball into the death drive, but rather than play a, pop us into a game, it actually popped us out in the real CIA. We are actually in the real CIA right now. But it's not really us, because uh, as, you, as you're aware, uh, the death drive is actually an elaborate cloning machine built by a Juvenile in tandem with the CIA. Uh, as pretty much as a war device to uh, to create an infinite army of soldiers to uh, attack uh, various places. Um, so right now we are actually playing as a basically 3D printed clone of Travis. And uh, when we popped in the CIA death ball, that clone was printed out at the mother computer, the Death Dive Triple A located at the CIA. Now, if this is the CIA, why are there bugs everywhere? That's because these aren't actually bugs. These are real people that we're killing right now. Another uh, thing that was installed in the death drive to help it as a war machine was the ability to make it so that the clone's vision perceives the real world as a game. So all of the soldiers and stuff that the clone would be seeing are look like bugs, essentially. And that's to help with PTSD, because obviously war, war, war is bad. So if the soldiers are killing these video gamey characters and they're exploding in these, in these glorious confetti bursts and you're in these gamey worlds like we are right now with these teleporters and these, these neon walls and stuff then it won't make the soldiers think that, oh, look at all these people we're killing. And whenever we interact with the Hotline Miami arcade cabinet, uh, our vision actually shifts a little bit to see what is actually happening, which is why the sprites of the bodies in Hotline Miami start appearing on the floor as soon as we uh, interact with the arcade cabinet, because that is actually real people that we're killing. All of these people right now, these enemy spawners, are just, it's basically an army of CIA people that we are casually murdering as a clone of Travis. Again, all this clone and and uh, PTSD stuff would be completely lost on you if you didn't read the fax machine, so it, it's kind of weird. I guess 
I, I guess it's kind of similar to like Rosalina's book from Mario Galaxy One, where there is a plot, but they they decided that some people might not be interested in it, so like let's just hide it away in the fax machine. But most people play Suda games. A lot of people play Suda games for the plot. He's written multiple virtu uh, visual novels, so. I mean, if they didn't put it in the fax machine, where else would they put it, really? I, I guess they could put it after each each of the individual games, but still. I guess the fact that it is optional isn't a bad thing. But yeah, that's uh, that <laughs> surprisingly surprisingly intricate plot that's happening right now. And uh, as, as far as the people we're killing, I, again, it, it's implied that the CIA is, is pretty fucked up in this world. <laughs> like, the the whole their whole master plan with the death drive and the fact that they they were still striving for it even after like 20 years so i'm going to assume that the majority of people that we're killing are bad i guess i mean we've killed armies of nameless henchmen before it, probably a, a lot of the people we've killed throughout the games probably had you know actual lives oh fuck that's a sheep man which is funny, because that's actually something that No More Heroes 2 goes into, with the whole Jasper Bat wanting revenge on you because you killed his family. And by kill his family, he means those nameless Pizza Bat CEOs that you killed in that boring garage just to make a quick buck. Um, like, to us, they were nameless people that didn't matter, that were just a means to an end. But to him, those were his family, so it kind of, like ties in with with the fact that we're killing like nameless henchmen throughout all of these no more heroes games and how we're killing a lot of people uh over here so anyway that uh, that's that room dealt with and I, I got through the whole i got through the whole plot synopsis in, in the one room so that's good anyway i believe we're probably uh, halfway through the cia at this point again it's long uh, I, I remember playing this for the first time. I started rolling my eyes every time we popped into a level transition, and it still wasn't over. I was like, oh boy, here we go. 